Good morning. Welcome to Westwood Christian Church. I'm so glad that you've joined us on this holiday weekend. For those of you who are joining us virtually because you're traveling, welcome to you as well. I am uh, Adam. I'm the minister here, and I'm so glad that you have joined us today. Um, I <clears throat> want to make a couple quick announcements before we begin, and then I'll do formal announcements later on in the service. Uh, first, as always, if there's any way that we can uh, pray for you, if, if your information has changed in some way, uh, or if you are new with us, I would really appreciate it if you would fill out a Connect card. Uh, let, those are under the seats in front of you. They should also be in some of the baskets that we have uh, kind of spaced throughout. There's just a great way for you to communicate with me, with us here at Westwood for the things that uh, need to be prayed for, especially that's the way most people use those. And on that topic, I have two quick updates. I want to make sure everybody heard that uh, this past week, Don Reinke uh, passed away. Uh, he uh, passed away uh, at a local facility after a really quick battle, it felt like, with um, renal problems. But he, of course, had had um, some uh, complicating dementia, Alzheimer's things for a while now. Linda was, there, there, there will be a service at some point uh, here in the next couple weeks. Uh, we are going to wait for uh, Linda Auer, who you may not know is his sister. Uh, her, her family is going to be coming up here in a couple weeks. And uh, as we have information about that service, I will let you know that so that you can uh, plan to be at that if you would like to. Uh, of course, uh, you know, express your condolences to uh, Linda, if you see her, uh, and uh, continue to pray for the whole family as they mourn the loss of Dawn. And of course, us here at Westwood, right? Dawn was a very involved person here for a long time, and uh, we mourn his, uh, his passing as well. Uh, one other uh, quick little point today is that uh, we, we don't have, I guess we don't have any families here, but uh, we, uh, they're all traveling too, but we don't have children's Sunday school happening downstairs, I don't think right now, because it's a fifth Sunday and a holiday and whatnot. So if it's a little noisier in here than normal, that's okay, right? Jesus loves the little children, all the little children of the world, and uh, we do too, and so that will be all right. But I just wanted you to know those things before we jump into uh, our service today. I'm going to pray here in a moment, and then uh, Anne is going to come up and read some scripture for us. We will then be led in some, uh, some singing of worship songs by our worship team. Uh, we will, uh, I will preach a little bit later on on uh, Revelation chapter 22. We're going to preach on the last chapter of the Bible, so I guess we're done, right? Just kidding. Uh, just kidding. Uh, but anyway, I am glad that you are worshiping with us today. Let us go to God in prayer and ask him uh, to be with us as we begin our service today. Oh God, the King of glory, you have exalted your only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph to your kingdom in heaven. Do not leave us comfortless, but send us your Holy Spirit to strengthen us and exalt us to the place where our Savior Christ has gone before. He who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. Um, our reading is from Acts 16, verses 16 to 34. With Paul and Silas, we came to Philippi in Macedonia, a Roman colony, and as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune-telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, these men are slaves of the Most High God, who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days. But Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, These men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. 
the crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake, so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew a sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. I love that story. <laughs> um, the response is Psalm 97. Um, so I read this light print and you guys jump in on the dark print. The Lord is king. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of the isles be glad. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and justice are the foundations of his throne. A fire goes before him and burns up his enemies on every side. His lightnings light up the world. The earth sees it and is afraid. The mountains melt like wax in the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. The heavens declare his righteousness, and all the people see his glory. Confounded be all who worship carved images and delight in false gods. Bow down before him, all you gods. Zion hears and is glad, and the cities of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O Lord. For you are the Lord, most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. The Lord loves those who hate evil. He preserves the lives of his saints and delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light has sprung up for the righteous, and joyful gladness for those who are true-hearted. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks to his holy name. Um, come with me to prayer. Father in heaven, we just thank you so much for your love for us, and um, thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that you um, gave us, and you said we would, you would never leave us or forsake us. And we thank you so much, and you said it's that we should come to you in prayer. Um, there's so many heavy things on our hearts about individual things and, and things that, we, that affect our whole country, our whole world. Um, but um, in Philippians, you had Paul write, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So we do, do come to you, Lord, and um, with thanksgiving, we thank you that you are here, our prayer. You thank, we thank you that you are always here. 
we thank you that you know what's going on. Nothing is hidden from you. And, um, but we do um, come to you with our p petitions. And um, our hearts are aching this week with, with um, the tragedy of so many children um, being killed in their school and their teachers. And our hearts ache. And we just lift, we especially lift up the parents, the families, of um, the people involved in that. And we just, your heart aches. And um, if we lift them up to you, we pray for your comfort and so many other things going on. And we lift up the war in Ukraine and so many people are hurt there and other places in the world that we don't even have time to mention, but you know, you know the sorrow of, of everyone. Um, so nothing is lost to you. So we do come to you. We lift these things up to you, the spoken ones, the unspoken ones. But we um, do lift up a few things of um, people that we know um, personally in this congregation. And there's, I don't have a whole big list, but we do lift up Gloria Jean with her um, swallowing problem. Um, and we just pray for complete healing for her. I guess it's an ulcer, I guess. And so anyway, we pray for complete healing for her. And um, we do lift up the family of Don Reinecke that um, Adam just told us about. We just pray for Linda and the whole family um, who mourn him. And Lyle and Linda's friend, Jim Dunk, Dumka, Dumka, if I got his name right, that he um, passed away and um, lift up his family and friends and um, people that are um, healing. We lift up um, Marilyn with her broken collarbone. So good to see her today. But we ask for complete healing for her and all people that are um, suffering with injuries. And um, we lift up Becky, who's um, still suffering from the accident she had last fall and with the many surgeries. So we just lift her up and, and um, I was told this morning that her blood pressure is on the low side. We lift her up to you. And um, my sister Joyce, um, we found out that she does have cancer and we just, they haven't, um, she'll find out what treatments she can have. But Lord, we just pray for complete healing for her and so many other people dealing with cancer. And I also heard this morning that Gary Rockwell fell and is in the hospital, and we just lift him up to you, and so many other people that um, we don't have time to list. But, but you know our hearts, and we just pray for your wisdom and discernment for um, people in um, positions of, of government, of making decisions for other people. We just um, pray for wisdom and discernment for our president and all, all the way, everyone in, um, has an authority position. And um, we just, we lift up your church, Lord, that we would seek you um, closer. And we just thank all these things. We thank you that we can come to you. And you said that you would guard our hearts and our minds. And we pray for that peace that doesn't make sense. And we pray for that. And we thank you for that. And um, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Well, I mentioned earlier, our, our sermon text for today is uh, found in Revelation chapter 22. We're going to read verses uh, 12 through 21. They are in your bulletin. They'll be on the screen behind me, and they're in your Bible as well as whatever Bible app you might be using. I'm sure you can find them lots of places. Anyway, uh, this is uh, what, uh, what John writes to us. This is how John closes his book of prophecy. Let us remember this is a, a letter of prophecy. He says, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to repay each according to their work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are the ones who wash their robes in order to be their power upon the tree of life, and they will enter the gates of the city. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and fornicators and murderers and idolaters and others practicing falsehood. I, Jesus, sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star, and the spirit and the bride say, come. Let the ones who hear say, come. And the thirsty, let them come, those wishing to receive a gift of the water of life. I witness, this is now John, I witness to all who hear the words of prophecy in this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to them the plagues described in this book. And if someone takes the words of this book of prophecy, God will remove their share from the tree of life and from the holy city, the one described in this book. The one who witnessed these things says, now come quickly, truly come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord be with you all. A couple quick things. First, uh, there is a, uh, because Revelation is the last book of our Bible, it is occasionally uh, tempting to think that uh, John is describing the book he's talking about here as the entire Bible. But that isn't necessarily the case. Now, hear me say, I don't think we should be like adding and taking away from the Bible. But just so you know, uh, John is specifically talking about Revelation. When he writes Revelation, the Bible hasn't been put together yet. The, the, the churches haven't agreed on what letters of Paul should go in the New Testament yet. He, the New Testament is not a thing yet when John writes these words. So I just want to say that because we're reading this. It's, it's, it's tempting because it's the last book of the Bible. These are the last words of the Bible. It feels like this is the epilogue of the whole book. And that may be true to a sense, but that's not exactly what John means with his words here. Now, for my actual sermon. That was the, uh, that was the introduction. Actually, that was the preface. So you would have found that. Anyway, I'm done. When I was in high school, I encountered a book that quickly became one of my favorite books to read. Um, it was funny, it was compelling, and being a slightly geeky, nerdy, dorky kind of person, uh, it often crept up in the subcultures of my life. That book is uh, this one. This is not a Bible. It looks like one, but it's not. This is The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I loved this book. As a, I, I still love this book. Uh, it's one that I cannot wait for uh, Nathaniel, who loves to read. I can't wait for him to be old enough to understand some of the jokes that are in this book because I absolutely love Douglas Adams' writing. In the second book of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, there are five in this series. Now, in the second book of The Hitchhiker's Guide, The Restaurant at the End of the Universe... The president of the universe, whose name is Zaphod Be Beeblebrox, great name, right? Lauren said no when I asked. Anyway. <laughs> Zaphod Beeblebrox is, he's, he's on the run. He has, he has stolen a spaceship that has a special kind of engine in it. An engine that allows this spaceship to do all sorts of incredible things. And, and in, in, a couple chapters into this second book, Restaurant at the End of the Universe... He, he, he says to the computer, he says, take us to the nearest place to get something to eat. 
Now, part of Douglas Adams' brilliance as a writer was his ability to kind of pull the rug out from underneath the feet of a reader. Because what happens in Restaurant at the End of the Universe is that this ship, again, it's, a, it's almost a magical spaceship, it doesn't take them to the nearest, um, the nearest uh, 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 restaurant of their current time. It just so happens that at this moment in the book, uh, they, they are in a, a, an area that is where in a couple billion years, there will be a restaurant where one can eat while they watch the universe explode. This is the idea of the book. So uh, in, in this book, they, they don't go to like the nearest McDonald's that would be down the road. It just so happens that right in their physical place, Far into the future, there will be a restaurant here. And so the ship takes them there. Instead of going somewhere in their current time period, it goes far into the future and finds a restaurant where they currently are, but a long time into the future. Anyway, again, it's funnier when you read it. I'm not Douglas Adams. What happens when they get to the restaurant at the end of the universe is interesting to me. You see, Douglas Adams described himself as a radical atheist. Much of this book, I have learned since I fell in love with it, is Douglas Adams poking fun at people like you and me, people who believe that something greater is out there. Part of what he's doing is he's making fun of Christians. You see, as, as the universe is about to explode, the MC of the event, because of course you have an MC, right? you've got to pay that guy. There's a DJ for the end of the universe's explosion. He's poking fun at the different groups of people who are around. And at one point he says, I believe we have with us here tonight a party of believers, very devout believers from the church of the second coming of the great prophet Zarquan. There were about 20 of them sitting right out on the edge of the floor, ascetically dressed, sipping mineral water nervously and staying apart from the festivities. They blinked resentfully as the spotlight was turned from on them. Ah, there they are, said Max, sitting there patiently. He said he'd come again, and he's kept you waiting a long time. So let's hope he's hurrying, fellas, because he's only got eight minutes left. The party of Zarquan's followers sat rigid, refusing to be buffeted by the waves of uncharitable laughter which swept over them. Max restrained his audience. No, but seriously, folks, seriously, no offense, Matt. No, I know we shouldn't make fun of deeply held beliefs, so I think a big hand, please, for the great prophet Zarquan. As he, that chapter continues, the great prophet Zarquan does arrive with less than a minute before the universe explodes. And he actually, again, Douglas Adams poking fun at believers. Zarquan rambles on so long that the universe explodes and he doesn't actually save them. Later in that chapter, we learn just how long it's been since the heart of gold, that's their spaceship, since it left the one time to go into the future. You see, again, part of Douglas Adams' humor is that there's a robot who's part of their party. His name is Marvin. Marvin's a very depressed robot, which is part of the joke that they can have feelings. But Marvin is somehow outside of the ship when it teleports into the future. So they find Marvin, who's been waiting in this spot. And uh, Marvin, I closed my book, I shouldn't have, because uh, his response is rather hilarious. The group comes up to find him. Only Trillian and Arthur went up to Marvin. No, we really are happy to see you, said Trillian, and patted him in a way that he disliked intensely, hanging around waiting us for all this time. 576,000,003,579 years, said Marvin. I counted them. Well, we're here now, said Trillian, feeling quite correctly foolish. The first 10 million years were the worst, said Marvin, and then the second 10 million, they were the worst too. The third 10 million, I didn't enjoy at all. After that, I went into a bit of decline. So I love this book. It's, 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 it's funny. I have to, as, an, as an adult, I had to temper my love of the book with Douglas Adams' kind of religious beliefs. You see, Douglas Adams is making fun of us in this book. Jesus said he'd come quickly. Douglas Adams knew that. 
people for, for the last 2,000 years, people have known that Jesus said, I am coming quickly. It's like, dude, if I was your mom, this would not be quick enough when I told you to put your shoes on. Like, what do you mean quickly, Jesus? What, what do you mean quickly, Right now, now of course, we've got this passage in First Peter, right? You know, a, a day to use a thousand years to us, and maybe that helps you. It doesn't really help me all that much. In our prayer today, we, 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 we heard a prayer for families who lost their children at Sunday school. A couple weeks ago, we, we saw families murdered in a grocery store buying food to eat. Jesus, where are you, we find ourselves saying. In Sunday school today, the question got asked, why does this stuff happen? It almost seems cruel, doesn't it, for Jesus to not be coming if he told us he was coming quickly while people die. We've got people being bombed in their homes in Ukraine. A report was published this last week that, that members of a very well-known uh, denomination of our churches were not only abusing young children sexually and physically, but were sweeping those reports under the rug, paying people off to not talk about it. I mean, the world doesn't seem like it's getting better, Jesus. What are you waiting on, Jesus? Where are you, Jesus? This is one of the reasons that Douglas Adams didn't believe. He looked around and said, I don't think he's coming back, y'all. I don't think he's coming. This whole idea of when is Jesus coming back has led countless people throughout the millennia to come up with ways to, you know, calculate when Jesus is coming back. Uh, they've done all sorts of, oh, it'll be on this day at this time. My favorite part about that is that um, the most recent, like, big one that I heard about a couple of years ago, the, the, the earth was going to end on rolling time zones. Like, it wasn't all going to happen at once. It was literally 10 a.m. in each time zone. And I was like, man, like, Jesus is moving right across the... It leads people to make silly claims like that which I don't think help our, our faith. It doesn't help our evangelism at all when people come up with these crazy claims about knowing when Jesus would come back. Uh, you know, interestingly, even in our movement of churches, in our, uh, you know, kind of brotherhood, Alexander Campbell, who was one of the founders of our movement, uh, his belief, and he's written about this, is that once everyone on the earth became a Christian, Jesus would come back. Wow, no wonder the earth is still headed down because it's not happened yet. This is the reason why the, 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 the journal that he would publish uh, weekly and monthly was called the Millennial Harbinger. He wanted to harbinge, he wanted to bring about the millennium by converting the world to Christianity. And there are other people who have had similar kinds of ideas. Once, once the, the temple gets rebuilt in modern day political Israel, that's when it'll happen. I don't think that's right either, y'all. And why do I think that? Well, here, here, here's why I think that. Jesus tells us twice, well, once in a couple different Gospels, that, that he doesn't know. Right? This is Mark 13 and Mark 24. They say almost the same thing with some, like, you know, conjunctions changed. About the day or hour when I will return, nobody knows. Not me, not the angels, only the Father. Which is always the, the funny part to me is that, like, once I say Jesus is coming back tomorrow at this time... I guess I've ensured that's not happening because now we know. It's, see, there's some bad logic there. Nobody knows, we're told. Nobody knows when. I don't know about you, but that bugs me sometimes. It bugs me that we're told soon, and it feels like not very soon. It bugs me that I look around and I, I see lots of heartache. I see lots of people who are, who are living what feels like their worst life instead of their best life. On Wednesday of last week, when I dropped Nathaniel off at elementary school, I gave him an extra long hug and an extra kiss, reminded as I was that life is fleeting. Jesus, where are you? You said soon. Now, I, I have to be honest that I guess in, in relation to eternity, anything 
is soon, right? If, if the timeline goes on forever, even 576 billion years, like Marvin had to wait around for his friends at the restaurant at the end of the universe, even that's short when life in the kingdom of God is infinite. There comes a point where even 576 billion years is really not that long. But man, is that hard for me as a minister, as a dad, to deal with sometimes. It's hard for me to say, this is what, this is what it is, I guess. This is the hand we've been dealt. Well, we know this is a, a problem that has existed since before the New Testament was being written, right? Some people think that uh, the, the, the Thessalonian letters, those may have been, at least 1 Thessalonians, may have been the first letter that, that was written by Paul. It's, it's either Thessalonians or Galatians are typically the ones that we think are early. And what's happening at the Thessalonians? We've got people who think Jesus is coming back so soon that they don't even need to work, right? Like, they're like, Phew. He's coming back next week. I'm going to just sit here and enjoy the last week of my life. And here we are in 2022 going, don't think so. Paul knew that, apparently, and said, hey, work until it happens, right? Stay at, stay at it until it happens. We're not going to know when it happens. It's going to happen in a blink of an eye. We're going to be joined with God or Jesus in the sky, right? All of that is because people thought that Jesus, when he said soon, he was talking about our language of soon, like tomorrow, a <laughs> couple minutes from now, right? How long does it take to get my place ready, Jesus, right? Jesus says, I've gone to prepare a place for you. And the longer life goes on, the more I'm like, yo, if I can have like a cot with a pillow and a blanket, I'm probably good. I don't need a whole lot up there, Jesus. Just speed it up. But that's... He says, I'm coming back. Hold on to that. I am coming back, even if we can't, even if I can't tell you when that will be. We are told in this passage, though, how Jesus wants to find us when he returns. He says, Look, I'm coming quickly, whatever that means. And when I come, I want to find you washing your robes, he says. I want to find you washing your robes. This is a reminder. We, we saw a couple weeks ago from Revelation chapter 7, right, that, 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 that we're told that those who have gone through the great ordeal have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, and their robes are now sparkling clean and white. This is a reminder of that saying earlier in the book, blessed are those who wash their robes. They will be given entrance into the kingdom of God. They will enter through the gate. They will be given fruit from the tree of life. We looked at that last week of, of the beautiful image of this tree that we will be reunited with. You know, in the early church, there was this, uh, uh, that same guy I read last week, Ephraim the Syrian, who had these kind of very interesting takes on scripture. He and some other people, Cyprian was one of them, great names again. They had this theory, I, I think they're wrong, but anyway, they, their theory was that the tree of life, uh, you know, we, we don't know where that was in the world, so the theory was that it had kind of receded into the ground, and that the cross that Jesus was killed on was made from that tree, that the access to that tree was given to us because of Christ's crucifixion upon that same tree. Right? There's beauty in that language, right? The tree of life. Jesus is killed on a tree, and that tree is what gives us life. That'll preach, I think. Because of that, Jesus says, hey, I opened up the way for you. I opened up the way through this gate to you when I died on a cross and you have washed your robes clean in my blood. My blood is bleach, he says. You know, many churches baptize in robes. That practice has fallen out of, uh, it's kind of fallen out of vogue in a lot of churches, uh, 
robes are hard to clean and they require lots of extra work. And so some people don't do that anymore. But for, for a while, baptisms often happened in robes. So that was somewhat true in the time of John as well, that baptism, the, 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 the kind of the New Testament version of, of circumcision, the, the New Testament uh, the way that we mark ourselves with the decision of following Jesus, the, the moment where, where we join Jesus in his death and in his resurrection when we are plunged beneath water and raised above it, right? He's, he's, John is reminding us of that as well. Blessed are they who have washed their robes. But, you know, I think that there's something else going on here, too. You see, washing, right? Washing clothes, it's kind of a menial task. Anybody like washing clothes? I mean... Maybe I'm asking this in the wrong time period, right? If I asked that a hundred years ago, when you're out in a scrub board in the in the in the basin, maybe it's less enjoyable than now. We just right, we throw it in a laundry machine. It does it all for us, and we come back in an hour. But but the, I I don't mind putting laundry in the machine, but man, do I hate putting it away. Just I just don't like it. It's like one of my least favorite household chores. Right? Hang clothes and anyway. But, but I think that part of what's happening here, right? Blessed are they who wash their robes. Blessed are they who take their eyes off the sky, who stop just looking up going, Jesus, when is, when is this going to happen? And put their hands to the work that needs to be done in front of them. Look, I was baptized 20 some years ago. And I will tell you that despite the fact that, uh, you know, I, I washed my robes in the blood of Jesus on August whatever in 1999, despite that, there's been a lot of going back to the laundromat in my life. There's been a lot of dipping that robe back going, okay, Jesus, I'm really sorry. Help me purge this from my life. There's a lot of daily work that has to be done in my life that that gets me ready for the work that Jesus has in front of me. There's a lot of things that I have to do in order to, to be ready to lead a church, to be your pastor. There are things day in and day out that I have to purge from my life. And I think Jesus is saying, blessed are they who stick it out. Blessed are they who do their laundry. Blessed are they who wash their robes. Blessed are they who do the hard work. Right? I mean, talk about washing your robes in the first century. There was def- they didn't even have washboards, right? You went, to the, you went to the creek and you beat them with rocks. Talk about a, a long process. You know, in, in, in Scripture, we have a couple different places where um, we're, we're reminded that discipleship takes work. Philippians 2, we have this passage right after the Christ hymn. Right? Paul has just said, this is who Jesus is. He humbled himself. He did all this stuff for you. And then he says, therefore, my beloved, work out your own salvation. Work it out. Now, I didn't have space for the, for the next verse here, but the next verse is because it is God who is working it into you. Therefore, work it out of you. Meaning, God is transforming you from the inside. Let, let the people who see only the outside, let them see you working that out. Then we have these two prophetic words, one from Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require except to seek justice, love, mercy, and walk humbly with your God. And related to that is this very famous passage from Amos, which was quoted, of course, by Martin Luther King Jr. in his I Have a Dream speech. Let justice roll down like an ever-flowing stream. I, I believe that that, that, that is, a, remi- that is a, a prophecy not only of what we are supposed to live, but it is a reminder that the living water, the ever-flowing stream in the water of life, the river of life, is a river where justice reigns. It is a river where justice, to do what is right, righteousness, live in this 
city that Jesus has given us access to. Right? That's what that says. It is my belief that, that there, are, uh, there are wrong ways to understand our relationship to God. Growing up, I don't know why this was what I, I but I used to think that, like the greatest threat to our faith was deism. I don't know why that is, but like that was what my teachers and whatnot said. For those of you who don't know, deism is this idea that God, kind of like a clockmaker, has kind of programmed the world and then takes his hands away and kind of just lets it all unfold before him. Explain Jesus to me, de- deists. But anyway, I think that's wrong. But there's, there's another side of that coin that I think is equally problematic. And that is the idea that, that not only is, is God the, the, the clockmaker who's put it all together, but that God is then each moment clicking the second hand one second further. That God is orchestrating every single thing that happens in the world. That, that everything that happens is the way God wants it to happen. And I just say, I don't think so. The tragedies of the last couple of weeks make that impossible to believe, let alone the tragedies of the last 150 years, let alone the tragedies of the last however many thousand years. I can't believe that God orchestrates each one of those things to happen that way. The Holocaust doesn't let me believe that. So there must be some sort of middle ground, in my opinion, that God is in control whatever that means, and yet our theory of, or theology of free will says we have some part to play, right? That we have choices that we can make. Now, it is my belief that only Jesus, right? Because again, there's this other problem that says I can fix the world if I just try hard enough. No. But... That doesn't mean we don't try, right? It is my belief that only Jesus will set the world correct. It is my belief that only the return of Jesus will put the world perfectly together. It is my belief that only through the power of Jesus will I, a broken, fractured image of God, be put together perfectly. I hope I get to keep my red beard. But it is my belief that despite the fact that only Jesus will put it back together perfectly, that there are things for us to do. There's laundry that needs to be done. We live between two advents. Advent is just the, the Latin word that means coming. Jesus came once, and he will come again. Advent is an easier word than parousia, which is what we learned in seminary. That's how you know I went to seminary. I know words like parousia. And right now we live between those two advents. We live between Jesus' first coming and we live live between his second coming. This, This last Thursday, some churches in the world celebrated what's called the ascension of Jesus. Uh, This last Thursday was 40 days after Easter. That's how long we're told in the book of Acts that Jesus lived on earth before he ascended into heaven. And next Sunday is the Sunday of Pentecost, 50 days after Easter. And so we live in this time period after Jesus has gone back to heaven, preparing some place for us. It better be dope. It's taken him a long time. And when he comes Again, it is my belief that somewhere along the line, we got so heavenly focused that we were no earthly good in the church. Not us, other churches, right? Somewhere along the line, the whole idea of the social gospel became a bad thing because people are, le- are led to prioritize either one's soul or one's welfare. And I think Jesus cares about both. Jesus says, I came to bring you life that's abundant. I think that's both physical and spiritual. So it is my prayer that whenever Jesus returns, come Lord quickly, whenever that happens, it is my prayer that Jesus finds us pleading with him to come soon 
with our mouths. That our mouths are, 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 are regularly repeating that phrase, come Lord quickly, come Lord quickly, come Lord quickly. Lord, we need you now, we say. But I hope that while Jesus finds us proclaiming that, he finds us at work doing the laundry that's in front of us. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you today, and we thank you for the opportunity to think and dwell a little bit on the future, the hope, the, the, the reconciliation of all things. That Lord, that is the reason that we keep on going. Lord, there are days where I struggle with what it means for you to be coming soon, but I do believe you are coming. God, even if that's not in my definition of soon, I just pray, Lord, that when you return, that you would find us at work around us, doing the laundry that we have in front of us, washing our robes in the blood of the Lamb. Lord, that you would give us the boldness and the willingness to serve those we see in need, that you would give us the willingness and the boldness to go forth in faith that we are serving you when we serve one another. That, God, we would not detach one's body from their soul, that we would seek to serve both. That, God, we would help people wash their robes in your blood, that they might come to know you in ways they never imagined possible. That, Lord, we would rejoice as the angels rejoice when one sinner repents. Lord, give us endurance to last however long soon is. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
This weekend, as you know, is Memorial Day. And for many of us, this is a time to remember family and friends who have passed away. We think back to time spent with these individuals, or perhaps we think about the relationship we had with them. This weekend, we also remember the men and women who have made great sacrifices for our country in the time of war. For many, they made the ultimate sacrifice. They gave their life for our freedom. We observe memorials in cemeteries and other places around the country to recognize these people and to remind us of what they did for our sake. It is important that we remember to thank God for these men and women for their service to our country. Today, we have come together to gather around the Lord's table. In doing so, we are observing and honoring the memorial instituted by the Lord Jesus. In Luke chapter 22, beginning with verse 14, it describes this memorial. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. It's especially important for us to observe this memorial. Jesus made such a great sacrifice on the cross for our sins. He made the ultimate sacrifice, and because of that, our sins are forgiven. As a result, we have the hope and the promise of eternal life. So it's important today and each Lord's Day that we recognize and remember what Christ has done for us as we share together. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to gather around your table this morning to celebrate communion. We're thankful for the sacrifice made by Jesus on the cross. We're thankful for the forgiveness of our sins and the hope and promise of eternal life. We're thankful that one day we will be with you in heaven. Help us to be mindful of these blessings today as we share together the bread and the cup, which remind us of the body and blood of our Lord and Savior. We give you thanks this morning and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us share together the body of Christ broken for our sins. And we share the fruit of the vine that gives us a remembrance of the forgiveness that we have. May the peace of the Lord be with you.
Before we go, I want to say a couple quick things. First, uh, as always, um, if you have an offering gift that you would like to leave with us today, you can do that in one of the two offering boxes that is that are by the doors. Um, if you would prefer to give online, you can do that as well. But we cannot do ministry here without your financial support, and I am grateful for the faithful way that you have supported uh, Westwood uh, so far. And um, I-, I can tell you that I talk to a lot of churches in my uh, work, and um, not every church uh, is experiencing the stability that Westwood has experienced financially over the last couple years. And that is because of people like you who give faithfully to support what we are doing here. And so I want you to hear me say thank you for that. Thank you for your continued support because we cannot do ministry without it. And I am grateful for you in that way. You can also drop any connect cards you have in those boxes on your way out. A couple quick announcements. I want to first remind you uh, that coming up on June 10th, uh, we're going to have a movie night here at church. Um, I believe this is still subject to change, but I believe we're going to watch The Lorax, which is, you know, Dr. Seuss, uh, The Lorax, all about saving trees and whatnot. But anyway, we'd love for you to come to that. Uh, bring your family. If the weather's nice, we're going to be outside. We're going to get an outdoor movie screen and set that up outside so we can kind of do that on our big, nice, beautiful green. I'd like for you to bring some food. We'll share in that together and have a great time of fellowship. Uh, The following Sunday on June 12th, we have that meeting after church with the Student International Conference of Ministry, or sorry, Student International Conference of Missions Director. Uh, His name is Jacob. He'll be here that day uh, after church for that. Um, There's one thing not on here. Um, That is the men's breakfast that happens on uh, June 11th. Big weekend, 10, 11, 12, but I hope you'll come to that as well. That is uh, kind of the father-son uh, version of the, um, the women's uh, mug and muffin that we did in May. You don't have to have a son or, you know, you don't have to have children to come to that, but we especially are kind of uh, celebrating fathers that, uh, that weekend, and I'd love for you to be there. One important note is that that normally, normally that takes place at 7.30. On that day, June 11th, it's going to be at 8.30. Okay, 8.30 um, uh, that, that, that Saturday for the men's breakfast. I would love for you to be at that. The last announcement that I have real quickly is that um, hopefully next week, but maybe not for two weeks because of shipping problems, uh, we are going to be doing a book study uh, in our Sunday school class over the summer. Um, I have ordered copies of the book. It's this book by Gary Thomas called Sacred Pathways. Um, It's a book all about how to help us learn the way in which God most um, effectively communicates with us, because it is my belief, as it is Gary Thomas's belief, that we're not all the same person. And so we shouldn't expect our faith to look to be the exact same experience as everybody else. And so what can we learn from that? I have purchased the books for this. Um, if you want to buy your book, uh, I, we, we can handle that. But this is a gift because I believe it will help you uh, with your spiritual walk this summer. So uh, join us for Sunday school. If, 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 you're, if you're a leader of a small group that happens, I know we have a couple of those, and you'd prefer to talk about this in your small group and not come at 9 a.m. for Sunday school, uh, I mean, shame on you, but I'm just kidding. Uh, But if you want to do that, I I will have extra books and we can make those available for your small group as well. I would love for you to join us uh, uh, for this summer study together. What's really nice about it too is that the chapters of this book are really easy to talk about one off. So if you're going to travel this summer, not a problem. We'd still love for you to join us for that discussion at 9 a.m. throughout the summer. Uh, Hopefully books will be here next week. But uh, when I ordered, they said this should take between two and eight business days but maybe add 14 days. And I was like, well, that's not helpful at all. Like, anyway, so uh, that's what I know. And I hope that you will join us next week for the start of that Sunday school series through the summer. Would you please stand? I would like to read, um, this is from John's prayer or Jesus's prayer in the gospel of John. Jesus prayed for his disciples and he said, I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, they all, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them so that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. 
that they may become completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and loved me even as you, or sorry, I have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that also those whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them and they will make it known so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Go in peace in the love of the Lord, rescuing or rejoicing in his glory.